This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, it's great to be here um, in, the, in the frozen north. <laughs> Um, so this, today's talk is going to be in two parts, and the first part is about the, um, the topic that's in the title, and the second part is, is related to that, um, but it's really about uh, recent research that um, project that I've started um, working on with uh, Richard Barclay, who's um, somebody who did a postdoc with me and has stayed on at the Smithsonian to to do this work, and it's, um, I think you'll see how they're related. So I hope it doesn't come across as, as two um, disjointed things, because they, they really are uh, pretty firmly connected. <clears throat> so this is a, a common graph that a lot of people um, see in an intro geology class or earth history class, and it's basically the temperature history of the last 65 million years or so, uh, as reconstructed from uh, oxygen isotope measurements of, of forams uh, collected mostly through uh, deep sea coring uh, programs. And um, this is, I, I give popular talks, so I converted this temperature scale to Fahrenheit, um, and then it confuses me when I'm not, but I'm, I won't apologize for that. Just, we'll just go right ahead. Um, here's, here's global mean temperature today, more or less. And um, this is this temperature record. And of course, the first thing that pops out at anybody is that um, most of the last 65 million years have been a lot warmer than today. We're in the middle of a period of glacial, interglacial fluctuations. Um, and we also, of course, are in a period of rapid global warming. So um, trying one thing that Earth historians can do and that paleobotanists can do is try to to develop a better understanding of uh, the warm climates of the past as a way of trying to help understand what might be happening in the future. And a lot of my research in the last 25 years um, has focused on a particular uh, very short interval of time. So this is this spike here is uh, an event called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. I'm always curious. How many people in this room have heard of the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum? So, you know, some, but, but not all. Depends. If you're in a geology department, everybody's heard of the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum and doesn't want to hear any more about it because they've, they've, they feel like it's been overexposed or something. So it's nice to see that, that this audience is a little more mixed in that way. Um, so the, the defining features of this, of this very short-term warming event are that um, we see a global excursion, as it's called in the, in the ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13. And we see that in, in these little uh, 4M shells from the bottom of the ocean. We see it in organic matter in terrestrial uh, fossil soils. We see it in the teeth of fossil mammals. It's, we see it in soil nodules. So it's been picked up around the planet and um, it's a, a rather major change, considering that it's global, of about three to five per mil. So there's, there is um, this event that, that is uh, one indication of a rather rapid release of um, a lot of carbon into the ocean atmosphere system. And because it shows up in so many different places in from the deep sea to the to the um, middle of continents, it's obviously it's obvious that this carbon release has been mixed by the atmosphere and the ocean. At the same time, uh, there's global warming, and it was first detected in the oxygen isotope composition of these same kind of little forams here, and the global warming is um, about five to eight degrees Celsius. It seems to be. Um, about the same amount of warming from all the way from the poles to the equator. So it doesn't look as if the warming is happening locally or regionally. It's really truly global warming. Um, and of course, that kind of warming is consistent with uh, a big 
release of carbon. At the same time, the third point here, there's extensive dissolution of, of carbonate um, in the marine realm. So particularly in the, in the deep marine, um, at the, the bottom of the ocean, um, there's a, a clay interval, a period of, of time during which deep sea sediments are, um, are basically don't have any carbonate in them at all. Um, that carbonate dissolution event is another thing that's consistent with the release of a lot of carbon because you would expect that to, to, um, to increase the solubility of, of, of carbonate in seawater. And so you, you should get a, um, a dissolution interval if there was a big carbon release. This event lasted about 200,000 years. And because of the warming and the uh, changes in ocean chemistry, it's <clears throat> generally uh, thought that this is about the best analog we have in the geologic record for what humans are doing now. So the, the interval has attracted a lot of, a lot of uh, interest from um, <clears throat> in the geological sciences. Um, you're probably wondering where the carbon came from because that's the first question that people ask, um, knowing that there are no factories to produce it. And the, the answer is that, that after 25 years of working on the event, we, don't, we still don't really don't know where the carbon came from. And um, increasingly, it looks as if the reason that it's been hard to figure it out is because it's coming from multiple reservoirs of carbon. And um, the reservoir, it probably, uh, this is a period when there's, um, a whole lot of volcanic activity in the North Atlantic. The North Atlantic is rifting open, and um, the sediments that had been deposited in the North Atlantic over a period of 100 million years were full of organic matter. This is where North Sea oil comes from. It's the <clears throat> reason why Norway and, and Britain are such major oil producing nations today. Um, but the, the vul volcanism is intruding. Um, sills and dikes into these marine sediments and probably generating a lot of um, carbon dioxide. Uh, as, as a consequence, it looks as if at some point the warming that's the result of this volcanogenic carbon is causing the release of methane hydrate deposits. These are um, deposits in the ocean floor that are sort of in an ice-like state, it's, but you, this is ice you can burn. Um, and uh, this carbon has an extremely light isotopic composition. So this um, shift in carbon isotope composition that we see that uh, turns out to be a very useful marker for the event, but is also one of the signs that there's a lot of carbon being released. Um, it, it's a big change in the isotopic composition of carbon on the surface of the earth. It's a little hard to figure out how you could get such a big change, but um, methane hydrate deposits are, have a, a, a composition, a carbon isotope composition of about uh, minus 60 per mil in the standard delta notation. And that, you know, like a land plant is minus 27 or minus 28 for, on average. Uh, so this very light carbon is um, being released at some point, probably as a result of warming that's initiated by the volcanogenic. And it's also possible that there may be carbon coming from uh, permafrost or from soils um, as a result of either oxidation or wildfire. So it's a complicated event with probably uh, multiple, perhaps um, sort of positive feedback loops that are being generated by warming that initially comes from, from um, volcanism. And this is just to show the sort of give you a sense of what the planet looks like at this time, uh, 56 million years ago. You have an Arctic Ocean that's completely open, no, no ice there, no land ice in the northern hemisphere. And this is where the rifting is happening. There are lots of flood basalts there. And I'm going to sort of focus in on this area in Wyoming uh, in just a minute. This is a, a map giving you a sense of where we have information about the, this Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum event on um, either in shallow marine sections um, here and here uh, that uh, record in 
Holland diagrams, the shift across the boundary, or in a few places in Western North America, we have information um, that's uh, from um, outcrops that are actually exposed. And the primary one is, is here in Wyoming in a place called the Bighorn Basin, which is where I've done most of my work and, and um, that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, today. So this is uh, a very fortuitous thing. Um, the mountains are, are rising around this intramontane basin uh, from starting about probably 63 or 64 million years ago and going right through the Paleocene, Eocene interval. Um, and as a result, you know, these, are, these were weathering off at the time and, and streams were coming down into this subsiding intermontane basin and depositing fluvial soils or fluvial sediments, which were then being modified um, by soil forming processes. And the red stripes you're seeing here are uh, fossilized soil deposits uh, formed on those ancient floodplains 56 million years ago. And this very bright red stripe that you see here is actually the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum or part of it. Um, and the fact that that stripe is so thick and so red reflects an increase in weathering rates uh, on land at the same time, almost certainly in response to increased uh, temperature and, and precipitation in this area. Um, so <clears throat> I mentioned that carbon isotope excursion uh, in part, because not only is it one of the signals that we had a carbon release, but it's also a very important tool in correlating from the deep sea where we're able to observe changes in, in ocean chemistry and marine systems and the terrestrial systems that I'm interested in and want to talk about today. And it also uh, gives us a, a way of um, sort of tracking uh, changes in the carbon cycle. So uh, this is, these are results from a paper uh, that came out a few years ago. We um, got a, um, the opportunity to drill cores in the Bighorn Basin through this time interval, which is something that's not often done in continental settings. And it gave us two long records through the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum at a place called Polecat Bench, um, which had been investigated over many years, uh, looking at the at vertebrate fossils and also um, uh, changes in soils and, and uh, other features. Um, and uh, what this uh, core allowed us to do was to sample essentially centimeter by centimeter up through time, um, looking at uh, carbonate nodules that form in these ancient soil horizons and getting uh, carbon isotope uh, values from them. And they give us this very, very sharp, uh, this is just a few meters of sediment here, uh, a couple of paleosol horizons uh, showing um, this rapid, rapid increase in uh, uh, decrease in the carbon isotope composition of the soil nodules. And then a period um, of relatively stable but much lower isotopic composition, and then a recovery interval here uh, where as, the, um, as the carbon isotope composition of the soil nodules increases again back uh, toward the level that it had before the event occurred. So basically this is, this is uh, we think, recording um, the release of this isotopically very light carbon from the methane uh, hydrate deposits or other sources of light carbon. Um, and something that's, that, just to give you a sense of what that actually looks like in an outcrop, um, and I realize now this <clears throat> probably you haven't spent decades going to the same place, or to, at least not to this same place, which, which I have. So it's like, for me, this, I know what the scale of this is, but there's nobody standing in it. So you don't. But this is just a, you know, this is each one of these layers here um, is, each one of these is a fossil soil horizon. And um, that's just a few meters of sediment. And this is, this is the Paleocene here. This is before the isotope excursion. The isotope excursion starts there, and by the time you get up to this soil horizon, um, 
you're already in the, the, what we call the body of the carbon isotope excursion. So it's, it's a really, really rapid event. The sedimentation rates here are uh, a meter of sediment represents maybe two or 3,000 years. So um, we're talking about a very rapid release of carbon. And this has actually been one of the things that we've been working on pretty hard is trying to understand just how rapid. And this is from a paper last year um, where we've been able to correlate the, uh, using the shape of the carbon isotope excursion, we've been able to correlate from, uh, these terrest from this terrestrial core to marine cores through the same time interval that, are, that have a, um, a cyclic pattern of change in the iron content of the core. And that cyclic pattern is also seen in the cores on land. And the cyclic pattern is generated by Milankovitch cyclicity. So we've got um, basically a metronome that gives us um, these uh, 20,000, 21,000 year cycles, which are grouped together at 100,000 year cycles that are controlled by the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. And you can see those cycles in the terrestrial realm, and you can see them in the marine realm. And you can sort of combine that information and conclude that this onset event is less than 5,000 years. So it's, um, it's, a, it's geologically pretty close to what we would call instantaneous. Um, it's not as fast as the human addition of carbon to the atmosphere today. It's maybe 10 times slower, but it's, it's still by far the fastest um, event of this type we know of in the, in the geological record. So this has just made the event that much more interesting to study is to realize that, you know, it's not a perfect analog for the future, but it's, it's, um, it looks better uh, and better as we get to know more about it. Um, the, the other, there's sort of a local practical significance. This is now we're heavily into the geology here, but you can, you can detect, as I said, you can detect that, um, that carbon isotope excursion in these soil nodules, you can also just grind up a piece of rock and get the isotopic composition of the dispersed organic material in that rock because these are paleosols. And when you do that, you can find this carbon isotope excursion lots of places. The, the badlands I showed you, there are places where you know, every hill is actually has a record of this event somewhere on that hill. If you, know where to find it. So the carbon isotope excursion has something that we've, and this is a panel section across about uh, 20 miles of, of badland topography, where we've been able to locate where on a lot of hillsides the carbon isotope excursion is, which means that you can go out there and start digging holes looking for plant fossils, which is where my primary research interest is. And I just made a little montage here of, of the process since um, it may be that some of you haven't um, had the, the life transforming experience of collecting plant fossils. I know some people have, but, but it's, uh, if, if, you know, you should be careful. It's kind of like your first, uh, you know, just, I'll just try heroin just once. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, you, you really have to be careful about this because if you do it, you might decide that it's so much fun, you just have to keep doing it. Um, so so these, are, these are bad lands. So that the, pro the problem is not that there's no place to look. The problem is you can look anywhere and you have to figure out where there actually are plant fossils in the ground, but they don't weather out. So everyone, you know, if you're a paleontologist, everyone says, oh, you must, uh, go collect dinosaurs. No, I don't collect dinosaurs. And, you know, dinosaurs, you might be able to find a dinosaur because it would be weathering out of the side of the hill. But um, the kind of plant fossils I find do not weather out. They just turn to dust. Um, so the only way to really find them is to go uh, dig a hole with a shovel. So your shovel is basically your eyes. Um, and the hills look different if you look at them for long enough. Um, but I dig a lot of little holes um, looking for a place that looks like it, the rock might have preserved organic matter. And then uh, if you find organic matter, you might dig a slightly larger hole. And uh, 
if there's um, some indication of leaf fossils or other kinds of plant fossils, you might get your friends to come help you and dig a bigger hole. <laughs> and then you can end up, if in a really good spot, you can dig really big holes. This is my, this is my proudest accomplishment of my career because if you know what year to look on, you can see this hole on, on Google Earth uh, from space. So I, I made a, a structure briefly that uh, could be seen from space. Um, this is this is a um, a hole that produced some really nice plant fossils. This is actually in the PETM, um, and once we find them, we uh, use extremely technologically advanced equipment to uh, bind them up so they don't fall apart on the trip back to the museum, and then they they go back and and sit in the dusty uh, collections areas and get studied by me and other people who are interested in them. So um, that's the life cycle of, of fossils, um, or at least studying fossils. And over a period of time, I've, um, this record goes from, uh, this is just a piece of the record from 56.2 to 55.2. This is a million years of time. And um, the, the record that I've assembled of Flora's through time is, goes for another three or four million years that way and another three or four million years this way. But this is the part of it I wanted to focus on today. And each one of these crosses is a place in uh, the Bighorn Basin where we've measured a section and we know where we are in relation to the carbon isotope excursion. So time is running this way. And I just stacked up the localities. So they tend to occur in groupings because um, once you find an interval of time where you have good preservation, you often find a bunch of sites at that same level where you can find plant fossils. And so we have a bunch of localities here and then a bunch there, and then a bunch here at the very end of the Paleocene. And this is that onset of the carbon isotope excursion and the body of the carbon isotope excursion here. And there um, not as many, but there are now something like 15 sites um, within the body of the excursion. And then there are a bunch that are during that recovery interval as the carbon isotope composition is returning back to um, what it was before. And also the climate is returning to its previous state. And then we have a bunch more localities here. So I just piled them up. There are about 100 localities in this million year interval. and um, so it gives you, you know, like we don't have a perfect record. We wish, you know, I, I would, um, if anyone can help me fill in that gap, that's about a 30,000 year long gap right before the onset of the excursion. Don't have any sites there yet. Um, but um, but we, have, we have a record that we actually, you know, can sort of feel pretty decent about using. And <clears throat> so I, you bring back the floras, you, you divide them up into, um, uh, provisional species units, um, and then you can start to put together a record of how the flora changed over time. And this is a, to a paleontologist, this is sort of like um, the most basic standard diagram, but I'm going to explain it to you in case you're not used to looking at these. So this is time again going this way. This, these are um, the stratigraphic ranges of different taxa, different species level units, and uh, every place where there's a ball is a locality where it's actually recorded. And I'm making the assumption that the species uh, was present in this area between the places where it actually occurs. But of course, it's always possible that that's incorrect, that it went locally extinct and then came back again. Um, and uh, here's again the body of the carbon isotope excursion that represents the period when the climate was the most, was the hottest and the most different from the background climate state. And here's the recovery interval. And you can sort of divide this up, this range chart, stratigraphic range chart up into chunks of ranges of different types. And um, I'm going to describe them and I ask you to notice the, um, uh, the color scheme here of the boxes. So in blue, we've got 
species that come up close to the end of the Paleocene and then we never see them again. And those are what I would call possible extinctions, at least repermanent regional extirpations of those species. Um, you might wonder why they don't all come up right to the end. That's because sampling is not as good as, as it might be. So you would expect that um, species that you don't always sample are going to sometimes their last occurrence will be before their actual last occurrence. Um, there's another group of species here uh, in orange that are, have never been detected in the Paleocene and they've never been detected in this area after the, the PETM. They're only found during this period of warm climate. So that's kind of an interesting, it's like, you know, first, first take on this is these guys are immigrating into this part of the world during this period of much warmer climate and um, then they're disappearing again when the climate cools. Um, there are a few taxa that go through, that appear to go through the event. Um, and then there's another group in green here that show up uh, during the recovery interval or right after the recovery interval, or in some cases a little bit higher up. This again could be the sampling problem of, if I had more sites, I might pick up some of these guys a little bit lower down. Um, but these appear to be um, immigrants. They're new to the region, but they aren't showing up during the event. They're showing up after the event. So they're sort of delayed immigration. And then uh, maybe the most interesting group in some ways are these, is, are these ranges that they, they, they're present, you know, in many of these species are present for a couple of million years um, down into the Paleocene, then strangely, they have no occurrences during the body of the, of the carbon isotope excursion. They start to show up again during the recovery period, and then they're found again in the Eocene. So um, these I would call local extirpations. They are, um, they're species that appear to have gone locally. Their, their local populations have disappeared during the event. They're not present anywhere where I can find fossils of them. And then they, they come back again after the event. So um, this results in, if you just sort of try to create the, the broadest scale, like would you, can you tell the difference between a PETM flora and a flora from uh, before or after, the answer is it's, it's really obvious. This is a, a non-metric multidimensional scaling, uh, just a way of um, putting in a, uh, a sites by species matrix and then uh, reducing the dimensionality of the data set um, to express on two axes the, the differences in, in uh, floral composition. And you can see that the, the um, sites that um, we have from the body of the excursion have a composition as reflected on this diagram that is really different from both the Eocene and the Paleocene. The Paleocene and Eocene are more similar really to one another than either is to these floras from the body of the PETM. And these um, red arrows or orange arrows are pointing to floras that occur during the um, during the recovery interval. So the body of the excursion is turns out to be radically different. The recovery interval is actually much more like the uh, floras from, from either before or after the event. And there's a lot of overlap between Eocene and Paleocene. I've also on this diagram um, coded each site by um, the local environment. So we, we get a certain amount of um, specificity of different plant species showing up in different depositional environments on the floodplain. So we find plant fossils very commonly in um, small lenses of mud that have filled in channels. So the channel abandons and leaves behind mud with plant fossils in it, and that's what we collect. But in other places, we might find um, a layer that goes 
a long ways laterally that that shows us we're collecting in a in a um, in a swamp in a back in a back swamp in a fluvial floodplain, and it's a different environment. So we find slightly different species um, in in that kind of environment. So I've coded these, and the reason I was interested in doing that was just to reassure myself that the um, we weren't seeing some kind of switch in the environments that would cause the floras to look different. Um, and so we wouldn't really be seeing the response to climate change, we'd just be seeing the response to some sort of change in the habitat mosaic on the floodplain. And the red circles are the, are, that's the um, abandoned channel, um, oxbow channel uh, environment. And you can see that there are a fair number of those um, circle symbols in the Paleocene and Eocene, and they don't have a flora anything like these Paleocene uh, Eocene thermal maximum for us. So I feel reassured that the, um, it's, we're not just seeing some sort of shift in what's being preserved. <clears throat> the first thing that might, uh, you might, it might occur to you to do is to, um, if you're aware that there are correlations between um, leaf size and shape and climate. And so we're able to take those fossil leaf taxa and, and um, do basically essentially a characterization of their sizes and shapes. In this case, I'm just gonna show you a one slide of, of results, but this is just to give you a sense of the characters that are being looked at. Um, leaf area, the number of teeth, um, the ratio of the number of teeth to the internal perimeter of the leaf, uh, the shape factor, which has to do with the circularity of the leaf, um, the perimeter ratio, and um, the ferret diameter. So these are features that have some climatic significance, but I'm not really going to use them that way. They've been, this is a series of modern sites. This is work um, by Dan Pepe and others where um, looking at, at living floras across a big range of, of vegetation types, you're able to characterize them according to those, um, physio, to those uh, leaf size and shape measurements. And if you do uh, an ordination analysis of that, um, you can then place those, um, those different vegetation types in a kind of physiognomic space. So this is, this is a space defined by the leaf size and shape variables. And um, you can see that there's a bubble here for a seasonally dry tropical forest. There's one here for temperate rainforests. And the, the Paleocene floras, um, and also this is true of the early Eocene ones, um, fit in this sort of wet temperate rainforest um, part of this leaf physiognomic space. So this has got nothing to do with the taxonomic composition of the flora. It's just about the sizes and shapes of the leaves. And the, um, the best site we have from the PTM where we're able to make these digital measurements fits in the, in the uh, seasonally dry tropical forest part of the, of the diagram. So this suggests that we're, we're seeing a major change in vegetation type as well as a turnover in species composition. So just to go back to this for a second, I'm just gonna now show you some of the taxa because it's always nice to look at a few plant fossils and, and think about what they might be. But I'm gonna, the, there's gonna be a color code here, the blue, the orange for the immigrants, the green for the uh, delayed immigrants, and the purple for the um, extirpated ones. So here are a couple of things that we think go extinct. They're both, um, this is an extinct genus um, that um, called Brownia serrata. This is uh, Davidia, which is uh, an extant genus. Uh, they're both in Cornelis, um, so a clade that has a lot of diversity in, in uh, temperate latitudes today, and they both go extinct. Um, then there, just to take a look at some of the things that, that are locally extirpated. So again, they're, they're in the Paleocene and they're in the Eocene, but we have yet to find them during the uh, body of the carbon isotope excursion. And we have a couple of different types of, of Platinaceae. Uh, this is an extinct genus. This one actually is also extinct. This is a, a trifoliate uh, platinoid, something that is a bit weird by, by modern day standards, but this is a very, these are both very common long ranging species. 
Um, we have uh, various, a couple of um, common things that are in the, in the Betulaceae. Uh, again, probably extinct genera, but um, pretty closely allied with or quite recognizably Betulaceae. Uh, this is something called Phagopsophyllum, which is probably in the Phagaceae, although even that's uncertain. Um, and this is uh, Circidophilaceae, Cir so Katsura tree. We have um, something that is essentially identical to extant Metasequoia, uh, Don Redwood, uh, something almost identical to uh, modern Ginkgo. And then we, there are um, members of the Loraceae, which are probably, you know, which is a family obviously with a lot of, a lot of tropical and, and subtropical uh, lineages in it, as well as some temperate. So it's not all warm temperate lineages that, that go extinct um, or that, go, that are locally extirpated during the event. Um, the, the delayed immigrants are also largely have a sort of temperate deciduous or temperate forest look to them. This is something in the Tiliaceae. Um, this is uh, Alnus. We have uh, pistolate uh, inflorescences of this that, that make it clear that it is allness. Um, we have uh, Ligodium, and this is uh, in the Juglandaceae and, and uh, very similar to Platycaria, although there's some dispute about whether it's actually in the genus Platycaria or something very close to it. Um, so these are these species that come in after the event is over but have not been seen in the Paleocene are also temperate deciduous species. The, um, the PETM only plants, the immigrants that are there for that brief, geologically brief 200,000 year period are really very different at a high taxonomic level. So Fabaceae are really abundant and also quite diverse. There are one, two, three, four, five different um, types of, of Fabaceous foliage on this slide and there are a couple more that aren't here. There are at least three different kinds of, of uh, fruits of Fabaceae. So we really have um, a, a lot of diversity and I'm going to just show you, uh, oh there's also, um, this is uh, an extinct genus uh, called Landinia that was named by Steve Manchester and Liz Hermson. Um, oh gosh, <clears throat> perilously close to 20 years ago. Um, the foliage of that is something that was even going back even farther um, was called Cedrella. Uh, so it, it's probably, you know, it, whether this is actually even in Meliaceae is uncertain, but it's, um, it has nice pinnately compound leaves that we have and we have also the, the flowers and, and where we don't have the flowers, we do have the fruits uh, from these same PETM deposits. Um, it's described from Southern Wyoming in a later period of, of very warm climate. Um, this is uh, something that looks very much like the extant genus Gyrocarpus. Uh, we have fruits with these very long wings on them, two, two big wings that come up from the fruit body. There are resin glands that are hard to see um, in this photograph, but they're there. And also in the leaves, these very interesting sort of irregularly lobate leaves. And if you uh, look at um, extant Gyrocarpus americana, which is actually a, has a pantropical distribution, that's kind of odd, but um, it, is, uh, it is pantropically distributed and it likes dry tropical forest. Um, so, and the, this is, you know, one of those cases where the fossil, even though it's 56 million years old, really looks a lot like um, the modern species, the, there are several living species in Gyrocarpus and um, it's, it is uh, remarkably similar to those. Um, this is one of the fabaceous um, leaf types that we have. We don't know which, uh, which uh, fruit this goes with, um, but um, we have some really nice specimens. And this particular um, leaf type has uh, an extremely distinctive venational feature, which is it, it um, has a, uh, a marginal, a very thick marginal vein that's on one side of the leaflet. It's actually the basal side of the leaflet. You can see it in the specimens that are preserved in attachment. 
And on the apical side of the same leaflet, you get a sort of um, a place where the places where the margin is drawn in along the secondary veins. And then there's this <laughs> peculiar uh, splitting of that uh, marginal vein so that it connects in two places to the primary of the leaflet. And that's, that turns out to be a very unusual feature. Um, and it shows up in the extant genus Copaifera, um, which um, there are a bunch of species of in the New World tropics. And it also turns out that um, it's, a, it's a genus that seems to like dry tropical forests. So um, we had the physiognomic uh, data that suggested that this was a dry tropical forest. And now we have just a couple of, of taxa that are these immigrants during the PETM. And they also, um, as far as we're able to tell, have living relatives in dry tropical forests. Um, and this is just a, a family level attempt to show you how different the, the PETM is. And I think I'm actually gonna sort of go through this one quickly because it's um, not terrifically important to my point, except just to say that this, is, this gives you, um, out of all possible occurrences, um, what proportion are seen during the uh, Paleocene in blue, the Eocene in green, the post-PETM Eocene, or the, the PETM in orange. And there are some interesting patterns here, for instance, um, so Betulaceae is very, uh, it occurs in many places before, before the PTM, in none during the PTM, and in uh, lots of, in a fairly high proportion of the places uh, in the Eocene, and Fabaceae has exactly the opposite pattern. So we've reconstructed um, with the aid of a, an artist what we think that transition might have looked like, and here's, um, a sort of latest Paleocene, relatively wet, warm but wet climate with uh, things like ginkgos and metasequoias. Uh, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, the body of that event with this dry tropical forest here shown in uh, the dry season, so you can really tell the difference. And then in the earliest Eocene, a return to uh, a similar kind of vegetation to what we had before. So what, what I think is going on and just sort of the, the biogeographic uh, view of what, of what we're seeing is, so we're, we're sitting and detecting all this in one spot. And of course, we'd love to have many other places around the planet um, when, where we could record the same event in other floras, but we don't have them yet. Um, but I think what, what is likely to be going on is that during the event, as the event sets on, we're basically getting um, as the climate shifts to a uh, much warmer, and in the case of this continental interior, also probably much more seasonally dry uh, precipitation regime, we are seeing um, species that, that had been occurring uh, much farther south in the, in the, in the, um, at the edge of the tropics, perhaps moving their ranges northward. We're getting the local extirpation of populations of of warm temperate lineages, which are probably then being left as relics either at high latitudes or in montane areas at mid latitudes. Uh, during, the, during the warm part of the event, during the body of the carbon isotope excursion, there's almost certainly some uh, interchange, and this is seen in the fauna as well as in the flora across uh, these holarctic regions. So you're, you're getting mixing of faunas and floras uh, between Asia and Europe and North America, in spite of the fact that it, they look like we have, uh, we have um, w big water gaps here. They must not be preventing uh, the um, migration or the extension of ranges across the high latitudes. And then as you go into the recovery and the cooling of climate, uh, back into the Eocene, um, basically some of those species that had gotten across between continents are moving back into the temperate regions, and that's where we're getting these delayed immigrants. The, the, um, 
the temperate lineages that are showing up in North America for the first time in the Eocene are, um, had been derived from either high latitude areas or from other continents than North America. So let me see, I am, is this, that's about it, isn't it? <laughs> I, should be, I should be wrapping up, and I sort of just did. <clears throat> um, and I'm looking for Alejandro to tell me what exactly, like should I go for, a f I, can, I can do a very fast version of, sure. of if, but I, you know, I, I know people have classes and things like that. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I will, I will give you the, the very shortest of overview. So the, 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 so I've talked about climate change. Obviously, there's another component of this is like, what's the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere? Um, this is a geoscience question. Um, and it was, and probably everybody's aware of this, but you know, this Svante Arrhenius over a hundred years ago said, and this is a quote from his paper, uh, doubling of the percentage of CO2 in the air would raise the surface temperature of the earth by four degrees Celsius. And this is the IPCC report uh, from 2014 saying the likely range of equilibrium climate sensitivity, that's the same number, is one and a half to four and a half degrees C. So you sort of feel like how much progress have we made in 100 years in knowing what the relationship is between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature of the planet? Um, it would appear not much. Um, so one of the problems is knowing um, is an in answering that question is it takes a long time for the CO2 to warm the atmosphere. If you have an event when the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere increased a great deal in a few thousand years, you actually have a great setup for answering this question. So the PETM is a place where we're trying to answer the question, and we're trying to do it with using stomatal evidence from fossil ginkgos. You all know what stomata are. Um, there's something called stomatal index, which is the number of stomata divided through by the number of epidermal cells plus the number of stomata. We have, a in these same sections that I've been working in, remarkably well-preserved ginkgo fossils. This is one of, this is a 56.1 million year old ginkgo fossil. And there's a whole plastic bag full of ginkgo, fossilized ginkgo cuticle. Um, and the preservation of these is quite good. This is the fossil, this is a living ginkgo biloba. And this is some work that I did with Dana Royer years ago, um, trying to develop a calibration for using herbarium sheets, like what's the relationship between that stomatal index number and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over the last couple of hundred years. It appeared there was a very strong relationship. Um, uh, Rich Barclay, the guy I mentioned at the beginning, uh, came to work with me on a postdoc and we discovered that the picture wasn't quite as pretty as, um, as we had thought it was when we did the work back in the early part of this millennium. Um, so the relationship is much messier. Um, these are points um, way out in the, so this is, this is historical data. And these are, this is, you know, a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere. There had been a few experiments done. We applied this, we developed a, basically um, a reconstruction of changing CO2 right before the PETM. And we have a few specimens of ginkgo from the recovery period. And it looks as if there is a substantial increase from, say, about pre a little bit more than pre-industrial levels, like mid-1990 levels of CO2, um, and about a doubling in the uh, last 100,000 years or 50,000 years prior to the PTM, which is consistent with observ an observed warming of about five degrees. So that, that's very cool, except we had a lot of trouble believing that because the calibration curve um, out here is very poorly constrained by just a few experiments. So a few years ago, ago we set up um, this experiment and suddenly I've been a scientist for 40 years and I can confess to you I have never done a serious experiment. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, I can say that to a bunch of people who work on living plants. It's like, I have never done an experiment. I'm an old scientist who never did an experiment. And now we're doing an experiment. And my respect for people who do experiments has 
gone through the I used to complain about field work, but experiments are really hard. So we're, we're you know, there's like we're, we have chambers and the chambers have blowers and we're exposing ginkgos to 400 outside, 400 in chambers, 600 parts per million in chambers, 800 parts per million in chambers, and 1,000 parts per million in chambers. And we're met, we have like, we don't have armies of grad students at the Smithsonian, so we have armies of volunteers uh, working on this project. And we have online volunteers, and you can help us with this if you want to count stomata, <laughs> because there's a, a site here where you can count them. These are people in the, in the cloud counting stomata for us. Um, and uh, so far, we're, we're, you know, we're, it's going to take a few years, we think, to, for the plants to actually fully adapt physiologically to the high CO2 conditions. We're not seeing a response yet. And we're also trying to make measurements of conductance and photosynthetic rate. Um, and we're also measuring their carbon isotope composition because there's some suggestion that the, the amount of discrimination may be uh, also a possible proxy for, um, for CO2. So that's the quick version of that. Thanks. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes for questions. All of the species that I recognize here are C3 plants. Do you have any indication of shifts between C3 and C4? We, do, we have no indication of any C4 plants. I mean, I, not in not in the fossils, but also not in the, when you sample floodplain soils for, for organic carbon, you know, the, the, the composition, the isotopic composition of the organic matter is always consistent with pure C3. But yeah, which is interesting because during the event, well, during the event CO2 goes up, so maybe that would disadvantage C4 plants. A few years ago, Michael Christensen and I showed that the leaves of ginkgo removed from short and long shoots of different LMAs. Are you accounting for? <clears throat> because of your paper, we are, and and uh, yeah, no, we are, we are, we are actually there are fifty leaves on each tree that are um, that are marked with a little tiny twisty twist tie type thing around the petiole before they abscise. Yeah. And, they're, and, and they're labeled with which branch they're on. The branches are numbered on every tree and the short shoots are numbered. So we have, we know which leaves are, not only do we know whether they're short shoot or long shoot, we know where on the tree they came from exactly. I hope you don't have ovulate too. They're all, they're clones, and they're all they're all male trees. So we are we're trying to eliminate some of the sources of variation, but not all of them. So why do you think that there is not yet a response in this in the in the ginkgo leaves that you've measured? <clears throat> um, well, I don't know why there's not yet a response. I. I um, I think these trees are maybe um, a meter and a half, two meters tall. So it's possible that they are, um, they have enough stored starch. And I, I mean, I think that they, it may take them a little while to, to realize that they're growing. I mean, they, they obviously have, well, ginkgos are, we, everyone knows ginkgos are stupid. So <laughs> this is, um, but they, they um, they are I mean, they appear to be changing their the the, um, the conductivity of the leaves. So if you can measure changes in conductivity. So, but there may be some history to the carbon that's already in the in the plant um, that's affecting how quickly it it adjusts its the model anatomy. That's kind of a made up thing. I mean, it could be that that. It could also be that they don't respond above some level of CO2 and that, that the entire business of inferring 
how much CO2 in the atmosphere is in the atmosphere above 400 parts per million or something is just balloon juice. I mean, it, that could be just wrong. Um, I think that remains to be seen. Well, thank you so much. That's okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.